Everybody, welcome back to Visual Novel Book Club. I'm your pal Slow Beef. With me, of course, my good friend Aaron Ronan. Hi, everyone. My good friend Jim. Hey, everybody. My good friend Turbo C. Hello. My good friend Devious Vacuum. What's up, gamers? You know, I try to make that as random as I can, but I'm. I, I think I'm curious if there's anyone who's done like the statistics on who goes first and last. Let's do the distribution. Oh, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Look, Fata Morgana. It's a long one, so let's 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 get right to it. Yeah, we gotta get going. We're at the final door. We're gonna learn. We're gonna we're gonna save Morgana's soul. The mission to save Morgana's soul. The characters, Michelle, and also Giselle with no body, who lives in his head. Um, Guesting on a stream. And, <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, yes, Giselle is. <laughs> Guesting on the street. Actually, yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. not a bad way of putting it. Yeah, yeah, she's a little bit of a backseat gamer on this. Uh, uh yeah, we get like a little bit of um, before. So we, before we get a, the title card, uh, three days before her, three days until her death, Majora's Mask. Um, we uh, get like a little like here's a little bit of. Uh, stuff from Mel's perspective. Here's a little bit of Yuki Masa's perspective. Okay, three days until her death. And, uh, Michelle and Giselle appear. They live in the dialogue window now. Their portraits are in the dialogue window because they're speaking. They're not, they're not narrating, I guess. Mm-hmm. And Michelle is, is present and incarnated, and Giselle is blurry. And, uh, Michelle has been incarnated in the time uh, that Morgana was alive three days before her death. He has been incarnated as a mortal man, like with his, he's got his body back. He has all the he has to you know eat and sleep and everything. And uh, and Giselle is where Morgana was, kind of in his head all the time. And very concerned about that the fact that she's going to be able to see him pee. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, because she's seeing base kind of an obscured version of what he's seeing, but she is getting a lot of the input, and she's like, "I don't want to see you go to the bathroom." Yeah, <laughs> apparently it's like she can see it, but it's really far away, almost. You know what it's like? Did you see that Black Mirror episode, uh, Black Museum? If not, good. I was gonna go with the sunken place from uh, from Get Out. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually, yeah, that's better, maybe. Um, Black Muse- Black Museum had this thing where you could, like, ride along in someone's head, kind of. Like, your consciousness gets, like, uploaded into their brain, but you're, like, a passenger, kind of. That sounds like it sucks. <laughs> it's Ratsu Prey, but real. Without, like, getting to, yeah, without, like, quote-unquote spoiling it, it does suck, which is like the Twilight Zone-y sort of twist to it, you know what I mean? And uh, turns out it's terrible, and then uh, there's a second twist on top of it where somebody else is doing it, even though we've established it's really terrible and whatever. So anyway, I don't even know. The point is, uh, don't do drugs. Um, so, I don't know, that wasn't really the point. <laughs> anyway, we, I guess I guess we've ad- ad- adequately described what this is, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, so... Michelle, like, he, so they're, like, walk, they're just there. Like, he, he's just like, I'm just here. And he's like, something about this world feels, like, off or whatever. He's not sure. They're not sure if they've actually traveled back through time or if they're in, like, some sort of perfect recreation or, or, or what's going on. Um, but they don't have much time to think about it because suddenly Mel appears. Yeah, it's the holodeck. <laughs> yeah, it's the, they are in the holodeck. Past Mel, original, the original Mel, um, is there. And he's like, oh, what? Didn't you, did you just appear? Did you just appear there? And uh, we have a choice of what kind of excuse we can give him. You can, we can say that we were sleeping in a tree or that we're God. So he is, he is panicking at this point. But the first thing that he says is, ah, there is a white-haired man here talking to himself. Oh, no. <laughs> As if there is someone else there with Mel for him to... He, he, he clutches his earpiece. <laughs> Colonel. 
Uh, Mel, oh Mel. Um, so I said I was sleeping in a tree. Yeah, me uh, too. Yeah, same. same. Mm, yeah. I know they're, bo- they're both okay, but I'm not sure what the response is for the second one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so Mel is kind of like, he doesn't really believe, Giselle's like, I don't think he really believes us, but he just kind of wants to get on with it. Like, he just kind of wants to look the other way and be like, yeah, sure, I believe you, whatever. I don't want to think about this, which is Mel. That's, that's our boy. Um, mm-hmm. And he explains the, the setup for the situation as he's like, oh, I'll take you to the church, which is the mansion. And, uh, he explains the harvest festival is coming up and, uh, and, uh, Michelle keeps having like moments where he's talking to Giselle, uh, and his outward appearance is just that he's just standing there staring off into space. <laughs> and, uh, he, uh, he's like, oh, that's when we're gonna die. It's like, we have to, we, we must have to save her from being killed. We, we have to get these guys to set her free. That's that's what they intuit their mission must be. So they have to figure out um, each guy's reason for, or like what circumstances led them to betray Morgana, like they did. And uh, so Mel's first, easiest, he's a mark. It's written all over his face. Um, so they, <laughs> but... They have to, Giselle and Michelle have to overcome the significant problem of the fact that Michelle doesn't know how to talk to people. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, this is truly a difficult mission for him. Not only talk to people, he doesn't know how to smile. No. smile. <laughs> and there's all these little things that like show that Michelle wasn't actually listening the first time when Morgana was telling her story, even to like at all, like because yeah. he's like, they're like, oh, the saintess is there, and he's like, the saintess is that Morgana? No, we know it's not Morgana. There's not that many characters in this story, Michelle. Please keep up. <laughs> you had to crawl through a blood house for this. Please remember the details. <laughs> Mel, who's that? <laughs> And um, so they head to the church with Mel, and they meet the the saintess, who they immediately recognize as Pauline from the second chapter. And uh, she explains the situation, that she was assigned to this church by the Lord. We know that the Lord is Jacopo. Uh, Pauline and Mel are friends. Uh, she has, you know, she's, uh, she knows him and, and teases him. Like, she's his older sister, kind of like uh, Pauline and, uh, what was his name? Ravi? Javi. Forgot about him. <laughs> Call rest in peace. And, uh, <laughs> so Pauline's like, right now I can't, well, we don't, sorry, she doesn't say that her name was Pauline yet, but it's Pauline. Um, she's like, I can't have anyone stay at the church right now. The Lord has, says right now we can't have anyone stay. And Michelle's like, but I'm sick. <laughs> um, and she's like, and she doesn't buy it. <laughs> and she's like, oh, but I can give you medicine. And um, it's, and she's like, it's called saint's blood, but it's not real blood. And he goes, it is real blood. And she's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and Mel's like, uh, excuse me, I have to talk to my friend about something. <laughs> <laughs> no. So Mel... Uh, takes us off into a, another room and is like, what the fuck, man? Well, how do you know? How do you know it's real blood? Who told you? <laughs> and you have an op- you have two options. You can tell him everything. You a cop? Yeah, you can tell him you're a cop. <laughs> you have or to tell you- him you're a cop. <laughs> right, yeah. This is legal. <laughs> and, uh, or you can choose to tread carefully. And I, I chose to tread carefully, because I don't think Mel can handle it. I told tell him everything. Yeah, I did too. You get a bad ending. You get a bad ending. You do. Well, you get killed. And you know it's going bad way before Michelle does. I, I from the first sentence, honestly, because I was like, okay, well, we'll tell him that we we know that there's uh, you know, there's blood in it, and they're that they've got someone trapped in there. Uh, Michelle goes a lot further. The first thing he says is, "I'm from the future." Yeah. yeah. So this is basically, yeah, this has become, like, Steins Gate, but low-tech. Um, and... You know what, actually, I'll tell you, I'll, I can give you a quick summation of how this bad ending goes with pretty much one line, which is kind of like Mel... Well, one scene where Mel goes, 
I need to think about what you're telling me here. Why don't you wait right here in this room? It'll take me about an hour to think about it and come back to you. Sure. You know, like, and, um, and Michelle's like, yeah, sounds good. And, you know, even Giselle's like, okay, maybe, maybe this will go okay. So, of course, uh, Yukimasa and Jack- Jacobo come with him. Um, yeah, this is also the only place in the part we played that you get to see uh, Jacopo. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And it's funny, too, because it's kind of like if Marty went back to Doc and was like, Doc, I'm from the future. And then Doc was like, I'm calling the cops. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So they kill you, huh? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah it's, it's very similar to when, like, he betrays... Um, Morgana. It's just like he he knocks on the door. Hey, it's me. You open the door, and then it's him and you know the swordsman uh, and Yukimasa and and Jacopo behind him. Oh wow. Well, that's nice. Nice callback. I I find Yukimasa is very creepy when we finally sort of see him. Yeah. You know his sprite is very different from what I. Not like extremely different, but and is is, is facing forward instead of to the side. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everyone looks more creepy when they're facing forward. It's it's funny because he's like you know he's a he's a handsome man I'll say it that Yukimasa but and I mean I guess like he doesn't look creepy in any stretch of the term you know what I mean he looks like everyone else but like he doesn't he like freaks me out and I don't know why <laughs> he he looks more like a normal like a human person compared to all of like the anime characters I would almost say yeah and I, and I and Oren brings like a good point too I think now that I think about it I can't well actually Mel stares forward too in this doesn't he. Yeah. Um, there's a couple that stare forward. Mel's looking right at us. Yeah, Mel's pretty creepy, too. Mel and Nelly just look like paintings of angels. Mel's a little creepy, but, like, Yukimasa, I don't know why, it just bugs me. Like, he's just, you know. Mel Mel looks like a depressed cherub. I, I, I think it, part of it is that just he, in the attempt to draw him to be, you know, of a different ethnicity, is he seems... Just slightly more realistic than everyone else. Yeah, the, the art style of like big, like he, like big puffy eyes and like really prominent eyelashes does not apply if you're trying to like get like a certain type across. I think also because he, mm. I mean, it wouldn't be in character for him to have big heavy eyelashes like all the other characters. Yeah. You know what's interesting, by the way? I, did you notice like? I feel like in horror kind of things like this, like they usually do like draw more, I guess, human proportionate eyes for lack of a better term. Like they kind of drop anime eyes like Jinji Ito. If you look at his stuff, like they're they're not like typical manga eyes. They're like more, you know what I mean? Mm hmm. Tr- more true to true to normal face proportions. Yeah. So it's like five eyes across, I think, is like the human head kind of portion, you know? supposed to anime where it's like the whole head pretty much but in this case uh, specifically trying to make you to, to make it like clear that he's Asian as opposed to the other characters yeah it's a weird distinction too yeah. mm. he also parts his hair in the center which has been creepy since the very beginning regardless of how fashionable it was at the time <laughs> yeah yeah all time yes yeah, the actual all time it's just serial killers all serial killers have always had a bowl cut and parted their hair in the center. Especially those people who have, like, the two flaps that go down the side completely evenly. Yeah. yeah that's, that's bad. So, at any rate, it's like, they're, they're kind of like, how do, you, how do you know everything? And Michelle's like, I'm from the future. And they're like, so that's, okay, that's bullshit. You can must have killed this guy. So tell us, tell us the real story. Yeah. And then he, he holds on to it really hard. And Giselle's even sort of like, I think you can do this. I think you can figure get out of here. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> right. Well. But, you know, we can't. So w- the correct answer is to tread carefully. And um, instead he says uh, that he sort of tells a story about Morgana. And he says that the Archangel Michael came to him in a vision and said to oversee the festival. And that he heard about that Mor- he heard about, like, I guess, like. By, oh, he heard about by, like, correspondence. But she sent a letter out, and he read it, or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, um, Mel's just kind of like, okay, like, he's suspicious, but what, what is not enough to, to push back very heavily. 
Um, and, uh, Michel, uh, also, he display he shows Mel that he knows the layout of the mansion and he knows about the tower to prove that, like, he got the, that he, you know, actually communicated, uh, with Morgana. And, uh, he says, he talks about, Michelle's kind of, I think, more straightforward with Mel because he also knows Mel and that he's a kid. And he's like, you know, you, uh, the Archangel Michael came to me to oversee the festival because he heard, like, your, I heard your soul, like, ask, crying out for salvation or something like that. Like, you asked me to, sa- you asked me to save you. Yeah, we know from his shadow mm-hmm. from the mansion that he actually does regret his actions. Compared to the other two, at least. So Michel knows already what's in his heart, and so he just kind of, like, goes with it and is like, you feel bad, you want someone to help you, don't you? And Mel's like, no. But obviously he does. Unless. And, um, and so he basically, uh, you know, Mel, realizing that, that Michel knows what's up, he's like, look, I'm, I'm gonna help, I'm gonna let you, you know, give you a, a chance to free her and make up for what you did, and... Mel's like, well, I'll I'll try to help you. I, you know, I I hope that you can succeed because I feel bad about this. And uh, so Mel agrees to con- to try to convince uh, the Saintess to let Michelle stay in the mansion. And so uh, she does. He can. And um, so now they have a room. So Michelle and Giselle sort of like regroup and decide, you know, plan on what they're, what are they going to do? And, um, and they're like, we got to talk to the people that each of the three men are doing this for. Cause every, every man's story had a woman character in it that they, that affected them a lot. And so they're like, for Mel, it was his sister, Nellie. So they're like, we have to go find Nellie and talk to her. Um, they also, uh, Michelle and Giselle briefly contemplate explaining the germ theory of medicine to these people so they stop drinking blood, but they decide not to do that because that would be too much. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. Like, And there's also kind of like allusions to the bad ending we got where he's just like, yeah, we can't give too much information too soon or this could, you know, this could uh, ruin yeah. everything we're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, they sort of just like... They're like, well, knowing what we know about the times, I don't think just shouting that the church is lying to you will go over too well. Yeah. <laughs> and they do point out, like, I think Giselle, uh, in, discuss- in discussion, the two of them mentioned, like, hey, we have no verification. We have no one to back us here. No one knows who we are. We just showed up. Like, all the usual sh- uh, social cues that would make people believe you don't exist here. So this, they're, like... They're behind the eight ball, and like they have no, like they have no advantages here. They they have to struggle to sort of keep up. But they do know what's every what is in everyone's true heart because they know them from the chapters. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of like uh, the social cues, uh, one thing that uh, actually was somewhat interesting, but also a little unremarkable, was that no one really seemed to care about uh, Michelle's appearance. Uh, yeah. This entire time. He loves it. He's like, oh, thank goodness. Like, it, I, I don't, what, this is what being normal is like. It feels great. I love it. <laughs> but, and people do specifically, like, point out his appearance. So it's not like he looks different to them. He looks the same like he always did. They just don't care or immediately can call him a witch. They're like, hey, you're here for the Saintess's blood, right? To fix, you know, that. Right, <laughs> they just don't specify what that is. The assumption yeah. being, there's a lot of sick and messed up people that are all coming here for the cure. So you know, you're kind of blended in. Exactly, right. And they they don't treat them any different, so that's cool. Also, what a difference a hundred years makes, and uh, but probably also being born into nobility, right? If if he had been mm-hmm. at this level in just like a sort of a normal village, uh, maybe it wouldn't have been such a big deal either. Yeah, they do say it's an in, it's a city that gets a lot of people, international people. So they might be used to people with these different appearances. Mm. Um, yeah, the one thing that does bother me in this chapter is that Giselle just seems to revert to her like original personality. Yeah, it's yeah, like, as, as if she she never lived those like hundreds of years. Yeah, from the very beginning, because like she's like, I got my game face on. You know, she's yeah. very like super positive. That's a quote, by the way. She also talks quote. about beefy men again. Yeah. Well, to be fair. She's like completely her original personality. 
Yeah, it doesn't. It, it is true. It would be nice to see her struggling a little bit more. But I think the problem with it is that Michelle is struggling so much to talk to people that if Giselle was also struggling, then they wouldn't be able to get anything done. Hon- right. Honestly, I, I I am happy with this because it is just a nice change of pace to just have someone that yeah again that is upbeat. <laughs> I'm it was especially this game. No, yeah, I'm I'm like okay with it, even if whatever you know what I mean. She's she's nice. She's she's it's a fun contrast. Yeah, you know, definitely. It also makes this chapter a lot more comedic than the other than the other part of the game. Yeah, there's some funny parts in this. Yeah, yeah, right. And a lot of it is because of Giselle's personality and the way she she talks to Michelle. I mean, she is just sort of a colored commentator here. Just yeah. It, it it really is like somebody who's not taking the game seriously is like let's playing it. Yeah. In a way. Like, <laughs> it is. And there's like somebody out there who's like, no, this is like a freaking serious horror. I'm so sick of this shit. And it's me, but you know, welcome to my low charisma run of uh, the 11th century. <laughs> 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 no, that's that's the episode title. Yeah, I'm putting it in the okay. thing. <laughs> what are you gonna do with that halberd, you dingus? Uh, oh, oh, did you stick yourself in the foot with it? Da-da. Me playing Dark Souls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so we got it. We got a lot to get through. So, the first stop is uh, to go to the cottage where Nellie lives. So, Nellie lives with Pauline, the nun. Uh, in a cod- in the cottage where... Uh, uh, is that where Pauline tells you that her name is Maria, though? Um, she doesn't tell you what her name is for a long time. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, yeah, it's not yeah. till we, like, go and talk to her and are like, isn't your name Pauline? And she's like, no, my name's Marie. Okay, so that's yeah, later. It's, it's after we resolve with Mel and Nellie, and then we go back to Maria. Yeah. So, uh, so th- until then, they just call her the Saintess or the Nun. They don't call her Pauline. But she's Pauline. So, Pauline. Pauline and Nellie live in the cottage together, um, the, the cottage where the observer uh, had lived that monitored uh, Michelle, and uh, there's a whole bit, Nellie's immediately scared of Michelle, and is like, this strange man is gonna do things to me, and he's like, no, <laughs> please believe me, it's not what it looks like, and it's just over the top, and um, also... Then Nellie's like, if you really are Mel's friend, uh, I'm going to give you a quiz about Mel to prove that you really know him. Right. Security security questions. <laughs> yeah. The questions are like, what kind of person is Mel? And like the answers are like, he's okay, or he's really <laughs> great, he's the best, and that's what you're supposed to say. <laughs> yeah. So I, to- I chose all the correct ones, but once again, according to the work tool, they, they all work. You don't get any... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure yeah. how, but they're they they are supposed to work. But it's even the right true. ones are telegraphed as hell. Because, like, they're all extremely yeah. obvious. So, it's cute. She wants she wants us to only say nice things about Mel. Um, and uh, so, in order to get information from Nellie, we have to become her friend. We have tea time with her. Yes. Well, first Michelle mm-hmm. tries to teach Nellie a song, and his singing is really terrible. And even Giselle is like, yikes, that was bad. And uh, and then she's like, "Well, let's go inside." She's so desperate for someone to talk to and like be f- someone to pay attention to her uh, that she's like mm-hmm. keeps trying to roll with it. And so she's like, "Let's bake a pie." And uh, but Michelle totally totally ruins the the pie, or it's really ugly, or something. And um, so yeah, there's a great like fail state noise every time. <laughs> like like oh, let's make a pie. Boom boom. <laughs> like oh my god, how is this food? <laughs> Sad trombone. Uh, so, uh, f- ba- finally, she's like, "Let's have tea." She has. T- she makes tea, and he ends up having to sit there and listen to her talk for hours and hours and hours. And uh, and Michelle, like, also Michelle doesn't like get how this could be useful. Like Giselle has to be like, "No, like you have, you know, listen. Like this could be important." Um, and it's really, they just sent absolutely the worst person possible to do this mission. If if things had been switched, um, you know, I think Giselle would have been a lot more successful. Morgana would be out by now. <laughs> yeah, Morgana yeah, would be yeah. free by now. <laughs> 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 
Just, just remember, in front of every resourceful woman is a completely incompetent man. <laughs> right. Um, and so, basically, Nellie, after she talks about all her problems, ends up saying, you know, I don't want to be alone. I would rather be sick than alone. I, you know, I, I want Mel to be with me, even if that means that I'm going to be sick and die. Like, I'm not getting better, um, and I don't want to be alone. And, um... Michelle, no, having read chapter one, um, explain. He's like, you know, Nelly, you should you should say that you you should tell Mel that you don't have expectations for him to be a perfect brother all the time. Because when you call him a prince, he he puts those high expectations on himself to be perfect, and uh, and it's you know it's killing him. And you shouldn't want to hook up with your brother. Just saying, just throwing it out there. <laughs> I don't know why, Nelly. Say just that. saying, that, you know, that's a thing. <laughs> it's weird he doesn't actually say that. Yeah, she she does in response though, like va- side sideways reference the incest thing, and he's like, "You need to tell her, tell him, tell you need to tell him how you feel, and it's going to be difficult, but you have to talk through it because your relationship is already strained. Like it's never going to go back to the way it was unless you talk to each other." And uh, Nellie says, "You're the first person to ever talk to me like I'm a real person," and so she says that Michelle can be her second brother. Yikes. Um, yeah, and Michelle is even like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's... My here. And the best part is, like at, one, like, at one point then he says something and she's like, are you hitting on me? And, he, and I want it to be his response to be like, well, you called me your second brother, so you... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now that she, like, trusts him, uh, they, Michelle and Giselle decide to take this opportunity to tell her the truth about Morgana. And uh, when Nellie asks how he knows this, Michelle refers to the story about the dove and the letters between the prince and the witch in the tower from chapter one. Um, so he says that he, he talked to Morgana through, through correspondence that way, by bird. Um, and Nellie is very upset, le- obviously, learning that Mel is involved in this. And um, she's going to talk to him about it. She is, you know, she's upset. She she wants to obviously confirm it with him. Well, she, she doesn't believe it at this point. Yeah. Does she? she? I think she just kicks, I think she kicks him out. She's like, get out of here. Yeah, and then Michelle tells her, we don't, we don't learn that yet, but Michelle tells her to come to to his room in the evening and hide her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we get it like a, like a censored part, yeah, where he tells her something and then that's it. And, um, which is a little silly. Uh, but uh, next, it, Michelle and Giselle want to go talk to Mel about Nellie's feelings to say, Mel, you need to talk to Nellie. And um, Michelle talks to Mel more and he says he's here to save Morgana and he's here to get Mel's key. And uh, he sort of calls Mel out on what he's doing. And uh, Mel, you know, gets upset and they're, they're in uh, Michelle's room at that point and Mel, you know, admits to what he's doing and uh, Nelly is revealed to have been waiting outside the door because Michelle told her to sit there and wait so Michelle in, has actually done a good one this time and he orchestrated them to be in the same place at the same time and over here and um, Nelly is really upset that Mel is involved in this obviously and she's like you're not my brother anymore and she runs out of the room and Giselle says, we need to go after Nellie, but you have a choice whether you stay with Mel or you go after Nellie. But Giselle's never wrong, so uh, I don't know what happens if you stay. Yeah, I just went with what Giselle said. <laughs> uh, if you stay, it is basically another, it, it's a replay of the, of the other thing. It's not the exact same, but basically you're like, no, you have to go, Mel, it's your thing. And he's like, no, you've been talking too much, you know too much, I'm going to tell my friends and they're going to come kill you. And then um, he doesn't actually do that, though. What he does is he kills you himself. He grabs a candelabra. Wow. Yeah. He grabs, like, a candelabra or something. Like, so, some kind of candle, some kind of, like, sconce that has a very sharp point on it, I guess, used to hold the candle somehow. And um, and and goes to, like, point it at, um, at, at, at Michelle. And Michelle says, like, you know, like, talks him down the whole time. He's like, you know. You don't want to do this. You really want to talk to your sister about this. This can be reclaimed. Don't worry about it. And Mel starts to loosen his grasp and lowers the weapon. And as they both go to leave, he's like, you shouldn't have trusted me. And then, wah, stabs him. Wow. Damn. 
That's kind of funny, though, considering all the, like, the amount of times this chapter that they talk about how, uh, Michelle, that they're pretty sure Michelle could, uh, could take, uh, Mel. Yeah, yeah, yeah nope. Michelle cares a lot nah, about that. Nope. <laughs> nah. Yeah. Can't no, happen. Cannot. No. Just demonstrated in that ending. Definitely not. Because, like, there's just no, like, they just... As soon as Mel decides to commit to it, it's just like, oh no! And then you know, the you get the it's basically the same ending we had before with the screaming and the no, don't die, and then he just goes to black. To be fair, he Mel had to kind of trick him, right? Like just mm-hmm. like, all right, we'll stop fighting. No, nah, 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 I got you, you know, like. But yeah. yeah. Anyway. Uh, and um, oh, there was also a bit. Speaking of Mel being a little shit, he does put you in a room and say this is the nicest room, and then later. Uh, when he comes around more, he says, this isn't actually the nicest room. I was lying because he's a little fuck. And I was like, mm-hmm. I knew it. I knew it. As soon as you said this was the nicest room, I knew you were fucking lying, you little shit. Well, it's also, isn't it the room that they they uh, put the white-haired girl in in Jacobo's uh, scenario to, like, not punish her, I forget, but to, like, keep her away from everyone? Oh, yeah, it might be. Michelle says it's a storage room, and it's a storage room in his time, but yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I could swear it's the same room from Chapter Three. It it it, it might be because the the layout looked familiar to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could remember what that room. So so anyway, we run after Nelly, and Michelle says to Nelly, "You can't avoid changing over time, but you can choose how you change." And Nelly's like. I want you know she's like I want to go back to the way it was, and he's like you can't go back to the way it was. You have to go forward, and uh. And Nelly is like, I'll, I agree to go back and talk to him if if you're there, Michelle, and you promise that things won't go badly. And <laughs> oh well, uh, and I'll prom. I can promise that. No, he doesn't say that. No, I think Giselle's like, just promise her, idiot. And- well, yeah, and and, and she's, Giselle also says because I think that Michelle's natural inclination is to be negative. So she's like, Giselle tells him, no, it will work out. You can do this. Don't tell her. The negative thing that you think is going to happen. Yeah. And so then he then he says, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll stick with you. I feel like he says something, yeah, that it's like, not diplomatic, but like, he doesn't lie. Where he's like, yeah, I promise this is going to work out. But he's like, it'll be better than if you'd held it in or something like that, you know? Yeah, he still can't quite be positive. I feel like as much shade as we're throwing Michelle, he's actually ends up handling this stuff pretty well. But yeah. Yeah, I think he just doesn't think he can. Yeah. And Giselle points it out later on that, that he's getting way more empathetic. He can definitely under- read people better and, and understand what's went, what went wrong in their past. So he's real good at communicating that to them. And so then we get a story within a story as Mel tells us uh, his story. The s- story of Mel. Mm-hmm. Which uh, wasn't a big revelation, to be honest with you. is kind of what I expected. <laughs> Here, here's what it is. It's not Mel's fault, anyway. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but I, I think if I actually, if I had one complaint, I do feel like it was ultimately that. But um, what? It, how does it go? It's like Mel's parents, like, or there. Actually, could somebody else tell this? Because I know he, like, I don't want to screw this up. Like, I the idea in my head where he. Yeah. So he he talks about how he had like a, um, his his dad died, and then um, as the. Uh, as the 17 year old he was expected to run the family but no one in the family thought he was capable of doing it so his uncle sort of stepped in and then his uncle apparently just uh disowned him and Nelly and sent them off to a cabin in the woods somewhere but like it was it was supposed to be like at first i think the uncle was going to wait f- he thought like they were going to like wait for him to grow up so that like he could eventually take over the family then he realized like the uncle's like no fuck that i disown him so i'll just take over everything and mel's kind of like happy that happened in a way like sort of relieved yeah he says it from the very beginning he's like i i had this idyllic life i didn't have to, i didn't have any responsibilities i didn't do anything um, I was a little put off when my uncle took over, but then I, I was happy I didn't have anything to do. And I guess that, that reaction is why his uncle was like, well, if you're not going to do anything and don't want to try anything, then just get the hell out of here. You're not contributing to this family at all. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, themes of like indolence and no responsibilities from, from Mel's story. Yeah. I mean, yeah, in per- it's tricky because here in particular, I feel like almost like if he's not really cut out for this stuff, then... 
it's I don't think the uncle did it as like as like a good thing, you know. I think the uncle was just being like greedy and shitty, but it just turned out like for Mel it's like yeah, no, I didn't want to do that anyway. Like that wasn't the life for me. But generally I do agree that I get like a feeling from Mel that he shirks responsibility, like even responsibility he's supposed to have. Oh, de- definitely. But not even it's, it's not just shirking responsibility. It's that this is a transactional time period in which you have to give something back. To like mm-hmm. to participate in the community, it's not like you just can't coast on being a noble. You actually have to like try to be the leader, and like he doesn't want to do that. So like the, he's giving nothing into the society, so they're not gonna give anything back to him. Yeah, they're sort of like waiting for for Mel to you know step up just a little bit, and he he never really does. Mm. And they talk a little bit later about how he can't even get a job um, yeah. when when he's out. Yeah, he just doesn't want to do anything. Except be said, I guess. <laughs> Most of the time. Right. So they give but they they end up wanting to something, they give him like a little house out in the woods with uh Nelly, right? And then he has to like learn how to do stuff on his own, which you know, the and, he has to kill a chicken, then. it does yeah. not go Yeah. Yeah. But like he's kinda happy at that point then. He's like, you know what, honestly, this is like work this is not a bad life, ultimately. And he like learns how to kill a chicken and uh Nelly likes him, and, you know, things are happy, mostly. And Nelly suggests they get married. Yeah, that's right. And he's and I have to admit, he's like, I have to admit, the thought crossed my mind. But it's like, okay, well. <laughs> he's happy, but but you get a feeling that once once they run out of money, they, they wouldn't do, even if Nelly didn't get sick, they really couldn't live, like, in that time period, with, with Mel's personality, the way it is. Yeah, no. No. Because they had some money. They, they gave them some money to to give them name for a while. But then Nelly does get sick after three months of them living on their own. And uh, Nelly gets sick and, and Mel hears about Morgana, goes to visit her. And he is the first person uh, to, to note, uh, again, like, he's, when talking about his own story, you know, he even says, like, that Morgana's voice, there's something special about her voice that, like, um, he, he's like, even if she's not, you know, magic or whatever, her, her voice was enchanting. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, he did, it did, it did seem that he, that Mel did earnestly become friends with Morgana. Like, he wanted to be friends with her. He was, um, he didn't really know what to do with her. But he did. He did want to be friends. Yep. And early on, he sees her. He sees that she like has a condition, and um, he doesn't. He he makes the choice not to react, and he also doesn't get. He doesn't bring it back up again. Like he just sort of like he accepts that this thing ha- You know that that she has some sort of condition that while her voice is lovely and he assumed she would be beautiful, she isn't. No, you know she has a condition which has clearly affected at least the lower half of her face. And, um, but he's like, he doesn't seem, is that, I don't know if he doesn't care cause he notices, but he doesn't point. He says, out. look, the vagina must work. So I'm fine. Oh no, I'm God. kidding. Sorry. sorry. No, no, Mel's come on. He's got a thing for her. I think, right? Like a little bit. You think? Or- yeah. They, they start to have a little bit of a relationship. He says later that he would, he basically has a thing for any woman who pays attention to him. He just kind of like goes with the flow. Yeah. He's a 17 year old male. I, uh, like- <laughs> It's not just any woman. If anyone had paid yeah. attention to him in any significant way, he would have been like, oh, shit, okay, okay, you're a possibility. Some things never change. Step up from your own sister, though, I mean, for sure. Yeah, let's definitely. be honest here. No, yeah. And let's be honest, Morgana doesn't even show any interest in, in him at all, and he is still trying trying to get with her. Cause they, so eventually they start going on walks around the lake, Um and we get to hear what it's like to have a conversation with Morgana from someone else's perspective. And Morgana's mm-hmm. pretty unpleasant to talk to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. She's had it a little rough. Yeah. I, I was, like, playing mental matchmaker here, even though I knew, like, what was, you know, wouldn't work out. But I'm like, oh, come on. They can get a they, These two kids can hit it off. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> but also, she says shit like, you wouldn't understand me because you're a human being. <laughs> like, you... Like, <laughs> <laughs> like you know, you know, to understand the pain I've been through, you can't. You have to be something more. Yeah, than that. she's emo. She's. <laughs> have you undergone the pain of a god? <laughs> like <laughs> she says, I simply lack the ability to understand or empathize with others. Like I mean, give me a fucking break, Morgana. 
I like how when she tells her own story, she doesn't point that out, right? Like, she doesn't under maybe she doesn't even still understand, like, why what she said was unpleasant. And, you know, Mel's like, I don't know what to do with this. Hey, Mel, dating a goth chick is hard. It's just, you know, it's the same we've gone through before. <laughs> no, Mel wants a goth girlfriend. She does. <laughs> well. Ah, uh, Mel. Mel Rhodes, the quintessential uh, internet soft boy. Um, <laughs> so. And his big pity goth girlfriend. Oh. Uh, I couldn't think of anything else. I'm sorry. It I works. It doesn't even make sense. Yeah, all right. So Mel believes Morgana when uh, she talks about her past, and he even says, like, there's no way that those wounds on her were, like, were self-inflicted. They were all from people coming to take her blood. Um, I think it's really interesting that he points that out. Like, they didn't, this didn't really go anywhere, but I thought that, like, all of, that it was possible that, like, each of the guys would have some, like, little note that implies that Morgana was lying to us before, but I think that's just how Mel talks, because he's a uh, little shit. Because <laughs> uh, that didn't go anywhere. Um, but eventually he asks, as we know, he asks Morgana to give blood to Nellie to heal her, and after he sees this this ritual take place, he's very unsettled by it, and he becomes afraid of Morgana, and uh, no, maybe no longer sees her as fully human. Um, and uh, when the healing doesn't fully work, Morgana places the blame on their lack of faith, and and she's like, "But you know." I'll keep doing this as long as you want me to, as long as you want me to do it, because, uh, you know, I'm here to, to serve everyone. And, um, seeing this ritual a bunch of times, Mel is more and more unsettled every time, and he slowly loses faith in the, in the blood ritual, and he feels like when he's, when he's talking to Morgana, he believes her, but the rest of the time, he's not sure, and, uh, because, yeah, so he's, he's, he becomes afraid of her. Um, then, uh, Yuki Masa shows up late, uh, a little bit later and explains that he has orders from the Lord to abduct Morgana, and he basically just almost comically, like, barges in and is like, I'm gonna kill your sister if you don't help me, and Mel's like, mm -hmm. okay, fine, please don't, don't hurt my sister, and, uh, the scene plays out as we know from the story. Mel does talk about what it feels like to just be handed a human arm and he's mm -hmm. like what did you, what was i supposed to do with it hey, throw it into the lake immediately yeah he throws it away what what the fuck else would he do he throws it in the lake and he's like what did what did this guy expect me to do with a human arm it is it is a good point i mean like i don't know what you did expect it's like here I, this this all i do it's got blood in it like that's just not how that works like what's the matter with you we're gonna stick it in some water and keep it for a couple of weeks and i'm gonna stick yeah around. <laughs> <laughs> i mean i i, I mean yeah you can you know if you i know there's a, somebody's at the real answer which is that Yukimaza is just kind of sick and you know that's like he just wants to cut off an arm is my take on that and you know it's like yeah whatever but that's that's my thing. But, you know, yeah, I, I think that was totally wacky where it's like, yeah, here's an arm. This, yeah. I'm, I guess I guess we're square, right? Even Mel didn't, is like, who would do this? Like, <laughs> when he's telling the story. So, Yukimasa is the worst. I, yeah. I, I feel like he's the hardest to write anything redeeming about because he is a murderer and a, yeah. a psychopath. Like, yeah. Uh, uh, I have theories as to how they're going to handle this, but yeah, I uh, I agree that, like, honestly, of the three of them, because we have to talk to all three, I was even thinking, I wonder if he'll be la ultimately be last, in a way. Like, the hardest to reach, you know? Yeah. But, at any rate. Uh, I, I, read, I read a little further. No, he, he's next. He's the next one we're going to. Yeah. No, I know. I, I did, too, and I know, but I was just saying, at the time, I was thinking that. Honestly, if you're just like, hey, hey, dude, you can kill more people if you let her go, he'd be like, oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, Mel just had no idea, you know, that that's what he, all I needed to say. Um, so then, of course, Yukimasa Yuki shows up again and is almost comically matter-of-fact with Mel about he how he must be involved in this whole thing still because he's a witness and uh, the Lord is Jacopo, who's a mob boss. So he's like, you know, you're in, you know. Can... 
can I just tell, like, my big problem here is this whole story kind of exonerates Mel in a way, right? Or at least in, oh. in, in terms of, well, I mean, I mean, at this point, he is under duress. He didn't know Yukimasu was going to mutilate Morgana. Um, and here, like, it's kind of being quote unquote forced to. And, and Miguel, Miguel, uh, Michelle, I don't know why I said Miguel, like, well, Michelle will, like, uh, will later point out, wait, did you really do everything you could have and stuff? But, like, I mean, there really, there, this also doesn't make any sense because why wouldn't you just kill Mel if you really want to keep this a secret? Like, you don't need him alive or Nelly. So th- th- they do try to explain it later when, when you hear from yeah. mm, okay. Yuki Masa's side. We get to see that scene in, yeah, in Yuki Masa's yeah. story. Okay. But they don't kill Mel. Uh, it's, it does seem weird. Um, and, mm-hmm. but yeah, so Mel's like, uh, so after Mel, so Mel's story ends and Nelly's like, see, it wasn't your fault. Like, uh, Yukimasa, you know, did this and, or they call him the swordsman. He doesn't have a name in this. Um, and, uh, he's like, you know, he, he forced you to, or he was going to kill us or kill you. And, uh, Michelle is like, did you really do everything you could? Like, could you have alerted her in, you know, to what was happening in some way by what you said to her when you got to the door? I don't know. I feel like this is kind of like choosing, like, to say, like, you should have died rather than give up. Because basically what he's saying is, like, if to do the right thing in this case would be to ha- to die instead of uh, betraying Morgana. And, and your sister. Yeah. And, and I don't, I mean. And... Yeah, and and really, to be fair, I don't buy that Mel necessarily knew, or even was in the right frame of mind to consider that Yukimasa might do what he did to Morgana, you know? Yeah, why would he think that, that he was gonna cut her arm off for no reason? I get a feeling, too, that even, like, Jacobo either didn't know about that or got, like, a story where, like, it was like, no, nah, he came at me really hard, I had to cut her arm off. You know, like, because it's like, it, it probably wasn't. <laughs> she already, she she took her arm off herself. <laughs> she Once had again. an axe in that hand. I swear today, you know. And Jacobo's like, you really didn't do this because you get your rocks off by cutting off people's arms and shit? And he's like, no, I swear, <laughs> sir. Uh, and then he would be like, because if you did, I, I'm into it. It's fine. Uh, yeah, it's fine. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not judging. I'm just asking. No, I swear to God. <laughs> so, so basically, regardless, uh, Mel feels really bad about this, obviously, and, um, and Michelle is like, oh, oh, Mel's like, she's never going to forgive me. And Michelle is like, is her forgiveness the reason you should act? No, it's penance for what you've done to her. And, um, oh, and then he does say to Nelly, like, if Morgana had been a normal girl his age, he might have chosen her over Nelly. Um, mm-hmm. which is what happens when they reincarnate if Morgana's the white haired girl, which she is, I guess. Uh, huh. Good. I didn't make that connection. Good call. So, um, so Nellie also says, like, I need to step up and be your sister instead of, like, you know, wanting to be your princess. And I think that also shows that the whole incest thing is kind of going away. Mm. But Nellie's like, thank God. Yeah, Nellie's like, all I've been doing is, like, taking from this relationship, and I need to support you, too, and, and be, you know, and talk to you as a, as a peer, and we need to support each other as siblings. And, um, so overall, it seems like it worked out. Yeah, see? And, uh, and Giselle is like, do you, do you think this is going to change the future? Who knows? And, um, Giselle also says that she regrets her inaction during the first chapter with, like, she, with Mel and, and Nelly, that she, as the maid, was not able to, uh, you know, keep things from from going badly. But I mean, that was her role. Uh, yeah, like wasn't that her whole thing? Was like she just didn't realize to, she has, it. She was just kind of like she had to like play along with Morgana because you know blood blood pact for immortality and seeing her love again. Whatever. Yeah, I mean, she she, but it's also the same thing that the work that there's the pushback on Mel about, which is you know like this this strategy of just like oh no, I'll just do whatever people who are threatening me make me do is fine it, you know for, for Giselle you know Mor- um, Morgana threatened her with you know not being able to see the person she loves unless she participates in these kind of you know questionable circumstances um, and that she could have done more and, and I think you know it, ultimately um, Michelle 
says, listen, there's, if you hadn't done this, I wouldn't have, you know, woken up and I wouldn't have, you know, come back and all this kind of stuff. So the, in the end, this could work out. But, you know, it's not, it ain't, it ain't the best choice. <laughs> right. I think, I mean, yeah. Well, uh, getting but like back to it, like the one thing I, I can definitely blame Mel for is after he's now, even as he's forced to be like a party to this and she's locked up, that he's not doing more to free Morgana or help her after the fact. Uh, but, you know, that I can blame him for. Just the initial stuff, though, I feel like I don't really feel like he could have done much differently without like I'm willing to die for this. Yeah, it's the difference between being an object of this action be- between being forced into doing something and the ideas of like collaboration or appeasement, you know, both of those, those both of those are you know a little questionable. But you know, in the end, you have to sort of maybe you. It's a poor choice. It isn't the best choice. It's a poorer choice. But then I think Michelle's point now is okay. What are you gonna do now? You just because you made not the best optimal choice at one point. We're here now. You have to make a choice now. I feel like I think what I'm getting from is that Mel, after the fact, is too afraid to do the right thing, possibly, you know, like, so there is, you know, it's not a heat of the moment thing. Now, at this point, you can figure out my plan is I'm going to get my sister away from here somehow. Then I'm going to free this woman. Then we're going to disappear or we're going to do something or I'm going to try to, like, save somebody in a tower, for God's sake, who's being bled to death slowly that I inadvertently caused and have to make penance for. Yeah. And Michelle makes that point. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. 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 Michelle's big point is, too, is, like, things aren't good. You, you didn't no. make it better. <laughs> things aren't good. No. You, this isn't This isn't going to work. It's going to end in two days anyway for you people. So, like, you didn't make the right choice. <laughs> right. Michelle has a good line here, too, because Mal is like, I went through so much. Like, I bet you don't know what it's like to be kicked out of the house by your family. And, and he's like, oh, actually, I do know. And uh, <laughs> I don't think it even shows the response. It's just, like, Mal's voiceover being like, oh. Oh, you do know, and yeah, my brother crucified me. Yeah. You want to play that game, Mel? <laughs> I just love this because he first at first he's he goes like, "Oh yeah, you must have had a, a pretty n- nice family life." Um, if if you're able to you know stand up like this, you your family must not have uh, disowned you like like mine did. And I was fully like <laughs> expecting him to just be like, "Yeah, you, you must have been born with a penis too." Like, how <laughs> on the nose are you going to be about this section? <laughs> but Michelle has a good line, which, like, Michelle, like, realizes something very important, and he thinks to himself, if anything, it's those who have lost the most who are likely to take action. So, Michelle mm-hmm. learns a very mm-hmm. important lesson. Good job, Michelle. And, uh, then, uh, he leaves, and, and wh- they talk a little bit before they go to bed, and, uh, Michelle and Giselle talk about how once the mansion is destroyed, their souls will become nothing. And Giselle's like, you know, she's like, oh, but, like, you have this life, like, you have this incarnation of yourself, like, you deserve to have, like, a life to return to. And Michelle's like, no. I, like, I I, I didn't do all this to, like, not see you again. Like, I'm, I'm gonna see you again, mm-hmm. and that's that's the plan. Like, don't worry about it. Um, but it seemed like she's foreshadowing something. And, um, so the, but the plan for day two is to talk to the nun to try to get through to Yukimasa because we know from the the story that they have something going on. Um, we know from Morgana's story that Yukimasa was doing all of this on her for her sake. Um, and then they also reflect on how they don't know who the Lord's special person is, but obviously it's got to be Maria. Uh, but they don't they don't figure that out yet, I guess. I mean, so much for, spe- like, special person, she wanted to kill him. I mean, right. it's a type of special person. And um, Michelle stays up late and talks to Giselle before they go to sleep. And, uh, but he he does need to sleep. And uh, as they go to sleep for the night, uh, the, the title card ticks down <laughs> from three to two, two days before her death. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's very movie inspired. Yeah, it's, it's Majora's Mask. It's, it's twenty four. <laughs> no, no. What if it? What if it had the timer? The dude, 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 dude. <laughs> that would be great. Um, or like a sundial. Oh yeah, a dramatic sundial. 
So Mel wakes up the next. Uh, Mel wakes us up the next morning and uh, recaps the story so far, <laughs> in case we forgot. And uh, they Michelle wants Michelle. He this boy never learns. He is he goes to the dining hall to talk to the nun, and he like immediately like wants to like push his way to the front of the line. There's a bunch of people there, and Giselle's like, "No, like wait your turn." And he's like, "This is important." And he like goes up to her, and of course she's upset, and she's like, "You know, sir, like you have to wait your turn." And they he gets escorted out. Yeah, mm. it's basically the most incompetent detective. <laughs> it's like, what? Are you? No, Michelle, I thought we were doing good. Mm mm. <laughs> so instead, while he's waiting for uh, the nun to have time to talk, uh, Michelle goes to the chapel and looks at the door to the tower. And uh, when he looks at the door to the tower, Yukimasa appears. And Yukimasa's like, what are you doing around that door? And he's like, I'm just looking at it. It's a seal. I was looking at this at this uh, stained glass, and then I noticed this door, so I was looking at it. And he was like, well, don't. Don't look at it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember how the conversation goes, but it sucks. And, um, Yukimasa, like, actually kind of, like, reaches out to Michelle a little bit, like, empathizes with him a little bit. He, he sympathizes with Michelle about, like, looking different from other people. And, like, they have a couple lines in this whole little chapter day part where it, I, it's really, it's ambiguous as to whether, like, Yukimasa is, like, being a serial killer or just like genuinely like attempting to empathize, but he comes across just extremely threatening. So uh, Michelle doesn't really like let him. Yeah, it's very much like the like, the, the mafia serial killer who's uh, mafia like hitman who's like, uh, you know, what are you doing? Like, I could take you out right now, but um, what what do you th- you think? I'm I'm an important person too. You, know, like, <laughs> you think? I, yeah, I, I could see how you're feeling. You know, it's, it's tough being looking different because I look different too. <laughs> <laughs> I should have broke your thumbs. Sorry. Yukimasa also says that he has no name and hates angels. Yeah. Right. <laughs> he's very like like every time he brings something up, he's like, "I whoa, I'm suspicious of you. I hate that shit." But also, like, you seem like you know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can trust you. It's weird. So Michelle uh, then is talking to Giselle, and, and he remarks about Yukimasa's time on the ship, and Giselle doesn't remember that, uh, so that was just a, a memory that we saw. She didn't see about him torturing those guys on the ship and like planting silver on them. And uh, they're like, Morgana did say something about resonating with the mansion, so they're like, did did Michelle see Yukimasa's memories because like he empathized with him? And he was able to see those things. Also, neither one of these dumbasses can remember Yukimasa's name. <laughs> <sighs> what else you got going on? You know, you're dead. You can't remember the man's name. Hold on, didn't they like have a scene where they're like, it starts with a Y, and they like kind of like had these, yeah, like kind of uh, you, yeah, yeah. They say they say like English words instead. Like they say like, is it like eucalyptus? Is it like yeah, yeah, like. Oh my god. We could get four syllables. We just can't fit those four syllables together. I mean, yeah. I guess to be fair, they referred to him as Bestia for most of it, and I guess if you're not used to Japanese names, they can they can appear kind of, you know. I don't know. It'd be awesome if they walked up to him though and called him Bestia. <laughs> yeah, I, I was waiting for like a dramatic reveal. Or I, I guess I'm still waiting on a dramatic reveal. Of, like, if they are going to remember Yukimasa's name, and if that's going to, if that's going to mean something to him, like, you know, but I don't know. Oh, my name is Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my YouTube series, trying to get Grandma to pronounce anime names. <laughs> my, my, na- my name is, my name is Mel. Oh, shit, what, you, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Michelle goes, tries to talk to the nun again. He goes out to the courtyard, and Nellie tackles him from behind, and um, and Mel's there too. Mel like m- remarks that like Michelle seems similar to in Mor- to Morgana in some ways, uh, which I mean that's like the whole theme of this whole damn story. So like we we know, and um, Michelle finally gets time to talk to the nun because I think Nellie volunteers to like 
make flower crowns so that she doesn't have to, so she has time to talk. So he has to, like, ask for help, and it works out, and, uh, and Michelle it talks to her, but it's, it's hard to pin her down. She doesn't want to answer any questions. She doesn't want to, uh, she's not open-minded at all. She's, like, you know, she's very closed off, and, uh, Michelle's like, oh, but you're Pauline, aren't you? Like, trying to figure out if she has a relationship with Yukimasa, and she's like, no, I mean, he's just someone who's here, it's not, you know, what, no, no, no. And, um, and when he asks her if she's Pauline, she says, well, no, my name is Marie. Dun, dun, oh. dun. Yes. So they say Marie in English. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because, um, I, I didn't have time to see the LP this time, so I just read it in Japanese, and I was wondering how they're going to do it, because, um, in Japanese, they're both called Maria. She says Maria, she doesn't say Marie, but it's spelled differently. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's, yeah. The, 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 the Maria, the Jacopo's Maria is like Maria, and she says she's Maria. And mm. that's different kind of, kind of spelling. So I was wondering if they did, did something here too, and apparently they did. Yeah, that's interesting. And also, he's, he's kind of like, <laughs> he's a very bad, like, interrogator. He's just like, I'm married. Well, are you sure you don't have a relationship with the swordsman? Like, are you really sure? And she's like, I already told you no. Like, that's the end of conversation. <laughs> but you do. <laughs> like, no, I don't. But you do. <laughs> it's great. I love I love Michelle. Yeah, he's so bad at this. You can um, just see him flipping a chair around and sitting on his nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Don't he's offended about <laughs> this is, it's a, Mr. Belvedere joke. He's too offended about not having those, yeah. <laughs> the Mr. Belvedere, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> they had to stop filming. Is this where we learned the Lord's name, or is that later? Not yet. Not okay. yet. Not okay. Yet. Um, Michelle doesn't know what to do next, so he just tells Marie the truth about Morgana. He's very, he's way too forthcoming about this. Um, so, yeah. but Marie's like, you don't know what you're talking about. The Lord stores his treasure in that tower. That's what he said. He, and he, she has a whole explanation for why. And she, get, you know, has the whole party line. And, uh, Michelle is like, that's not true. And, but he doesn't know what to do about it. And he starts feeling overwhelmed by the direct sunlight outside because he is, uh, he is, he does still have that, uh, problem. And he passes out. And wakes up talking to Morgana in the cottage further in the past before she was attacked by Yukimasa. And uh, when he realizes that he's talking to Morgana in the past, he starts to try to tell her, like, some guys are going to show up and don't let them in. And uh, But, he, but it, he, like, can't speak those words out loud. It censors them. And uh, when he looks out the window, there's nothing out there but a reddish black fog. So he's he's in the Morgana space somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has a he has a really intense heart to heart with Morgana. Um, he says, no matter what the consequences were of insisting that he was just a normal person, uh, he must not back down. He must not regret it. And um, Morgana says that she wouldn't take the hand of someone who uh, was normal but exceptional, like like Giselle. Like, uh, but she would take the hand of someone who was also abnormal, like Michelle. Mm. And uh, that as that fades to black, the Morgana of the present warns Michelle, like, this isn't going to change anything. You think you can talk to her? That's, she's not me. It's been too long. None of her is left in me. Um, but uh, Michelle wakes up in his room. Uh, and Nellie's watching over him, and she's like, you passed out! And he's like, oh. And she's like, oh, it's time <laughs> for dinner! <laughs> yeah. Um, also in that flashback, uh, Michelle, um, I think, I think it's during this flashback, Michelle, uh, think, uh, talks about, uh, Morgana's voice once more. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yep. And how he thinks that Morgana does have a power, but it's not the blood, it's, you know, the, the power of persuasion. Mm-hmm. And uh, Mel shows up in the room after he wakes up and says that Yukimasa has invited both of them to suffer, to supper, or suffer, <laughs> or suffer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Both. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> that would totally be on Yukimasa's invitation, though. It'd just be like, yeah. can you uh, come to suffer? Oh, wait, scratch that out. Crossed out. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, and he, he like, plays a bunch of childish mind games with them. Or, I'm like, I'm kind of ambiguous about this. I'm like, or is he? Like, is he trying to make conversation, but it just comes across as intimidating because everyone's intimidated by him and he's, like, super awkward and doesn't know how to talk to people? Or is he, like, playing a bunch of childish mind games with them because he's, like, setting them up to kill them and he's just, like, toying with them? I think that one. Yeah. I I, I kind of got that impression that he was, like, totally feeling them out for information and not particularly, you know. Yeah, I mean, he says, like, do you have any relatives? Like, he basically says, like, is there anyone who would miss you if I killed you? And I'm like, come on, yeah. you guys. Get it together here. <laughs> God damn it, guys. God damn it, you two idiots. <laughs> and, uh, this is like, you have you have you not been here this whole time, Michelle? Come on. Um, but, uh, dinner ends, and, um, uh, Michelle talks with Mel about the Lord, trying to get more information about Jacopo. And this is when we learn his name. Um, so apparently he's a very suspicious man who's, like, there's been a bunch of assassination attempts. He has people beheaded all the time for no reason. And his name is Jean-Francois Barnier. <laughs> and and both Giselle and Michelle are like, he doesn't look like a Jean-Francois at all! Which, like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> So, Barnier is also the name of the person who wrote that boring diary that they found in the library in Mel's chapter. Mm. Yeah. What a couple of Fata Morganas. <laughs> and, uh, so it seems like the investigation has, like, come to a halt. Like, there's no, they're not making, uh, they're not making progress, and, you know, nobody will open up to them. Um, but suddenly, someone tries to break in the window while Michel is in his room. And, uh, but, uh, they run when they realize someone is inside. And they run and hide in the bushes. And uh, Michelle leaps out the window to follow that person. And uh, they, the person in the in the bushes is is Maria. It's Maria. Mm hmm. Yep. And uh, she is a is a, a prostitute. Quite mm -hmm. interesting clothing for the time period. Yeah. Um. So we've got a uh, representation for the three types of women. Uh, nun, <laughs> prostitute, and child. <laughs> <laughs> Great! I love it! Um, um, yeah. I was just very frustrated once I saw that Maria was a prostitute. This is the worst fuck, Mary Kill. <laughs> yeah, it's so obvious. Um, so... <laughs> so, um... Michelle keeps running after her. She starts to scream, like, to say, like, oh, this man's, like, gonna kill me or whatever. And, uh, they run into the nun. And, mm. uh, they know each other. Uh, so, uh, the nun, Pauline, is going by the name Marie. That's her, like, baptismal name that she got when she became a nun. But her real name is Pauline. Maria and Pauline known each other. I've known know, knew, know each other from from the past. We don't find out right away why, but um, they're friends and they want to catch up. And Maria's like, "Well, you're kind of boring, so um, I'll I'll catch I'll I'll go with you if we also talk. You know, bring this guy yeah. uh, <laughs> because I, he seems very like mess with a bull, and uh, and that's that'll be entertaining to me, and." Um, this is a little convenient, I found. I, this feels like like a porn intro or something. <laughs> <laughs> like a fanfic premise. You know, like, I don't know. It'll be entertaining to me. You know, I I I'll, I'll, I have to say, I didn't think that right away. I mean, now that you say it, yeah. But, like, I was just thinking more like, oh, how perfect. We need information from all three, from, you know, Pauline and, and like, we had no real in for this. And now suddenly... We do, you know, that kind of thing, but I don't know. I, I It was a little unbelievable to me that, like, Marie is just like, hey, this guy's following me in the woods. Just kidding. Come with me and my, like, my girlfriends and we'll all just talk, you know, yeah. you strange guy. Like, what? But. So they go to uh, the place where Pauline and Nellie live and have tea. And Nellie is also there. 
And uh, as they're as they're there, uh, suddenly Giselle is very upset as she remembers that Maria called her a creep in the third chapter. <laughs> <laughs> so then uh, they start talking. With, it's like, it's time for a girl talk! And Michelle's like, ah, And I'm like, dude, you're here on a mission. Please, please, for mm-hmm. one minute, please be have one ounce of patience. But he does not. And um, the, so the girls start talking about uh, what kind of guys they like. And uh, they so Maria asks... Pauline, like, oh, what kind of guys do you like? And she, like, is like, no, I, I'm a servant of God, you know, I don't, I don't do that. And, um, and she's like, besides, uh, you, you know, there's still one person who hasn't gone, and it's Michelle, and we can, um, we can choose what we say. We can choose. So Maria's like, between the three of us, which one do you, do you like the most? Um, which is a trap. And uh, <laughs> did anyone try any of the other options? Well, then I did. I tried um, Maria, and I think she says something like, "Oh, you like uh, the kind of woman I am," which I can't remember exactly how she phrased it, you know. But like, she calls herself a whore constantly. She constantly reminds us, the audience, that she's a whore. I just yeah, please stop. She- she doesn't say that, like, oh, you like whores or something like that. I forget. It was like something like it was something on the effect of you like women who are dressed like this or something like that. I, I kind of forget. But at any rate, it seems like it goes kind of the same, except Giselle is like kind of upset that I didn't say I've already got. She's like, you kind of forgot about me there, you know. Yeah. So I'm like, whoops, re- reload. <laughs> yeah, those are the two options other than the three people. It's like I already have someone and I'm not interested in women. <laughs> Nellie's a bad ending, right? I couldn't bring myself to even test it, but I'm hoping it is. So it's it, it it's not no none of them. Yuji Masa comes and kills you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, and rightfully so this time. <laughs> um, I said I already have someone. Yeah, me too. But yeah, the, mm-hmm. the, the the walkthrough I'm reading uh, specifically says here that you should try to, to the other option because they're funny, but oh, I okay. never did. So. No. I couldn't bear it. I wanted. I want Giselle to be happy, and uh, and then he describes Giselle to the girls, and they're like, "Aww," and um, they're like, "Well, you know, are you, why are you away from her?" And he's like, "You know, circumstances prevent us from being together at this time, but I know that she still loves me, and I love her." And Maria tries to be like, "Oh, you just don't know the world." And Michelle, he does it right back to her, and he's like, "You know, have you ever cared about someone other than yourself?" And she's like, "No." And he's like, "Well, then you don't understand what we have." And she's like, "Ah, oh, huh." <laughs> uh, so, uh, Pauline still won't say, you know, that that she is the thing for Yukimasa. Uh, but she keeps saying, like, nuns aren't allowed to get married. We know this, everyone. I'm, I just love Jesus. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, Maria and Pauline are both from the orphanage that is referred to so often in this. And, uh, they grew up together. And, uh, Maria talks about how the director of the orphanage was cruel to her and not to Pauline. She's she's like oh he either he either loved you or he hated you and if he if you were if he, you hated if he hated you then it didn't matter what you did so I got in trouble all the time and um, by the way did I mention I'm a whore yeah <laughs> <laughs> and she says to that once Pauline she like criticizes Pauline and says like once you put your faith in someone you never believe anything bad about them ever like you're so stubborn the only reason you believe me now about the director you would you wouldn't have never have believed me at the time. Because you have such blind faith, and she's mm-hmm. like, the only reason you're you believe me now is also because there's like other people around, and those people believe me. And um, we also find out that Maria was one of the whores at the brothel that took in Morgana for the brief period dun, dun, of her dun. life, and she was happy. So Maria has heard about Morgana; she knows who she is, and and she knows what her deal is, and uh, so she wants to help us. She's like, "You want me to kill the Lord? I'll kill him." <laughs> and we're like, whoa, slow down. So, but yes, Pauline. Yeah, and Pauline finally starts to crack a little bit about Yukimasa, but she still won't say. Um, she gets upset and she asks Michelle and Maria to leave. And um, 
outside, we still talk to Maria a little bit more, and she says, like, yes, she was looking for the Lord, she was already trying to kill him. And um, she also says that when they were growing up, Pauline always wanted to get married. She was in love with love. Like, she, you know, dreamed about being a, a, a wife and a mother. Um, and so she's like, someone must have forced her into being a nun, because that doesn't make sense. And um, so that's an interesting insight into her relationship with Yukimasa. So then we get a choice about whether we want to walk Maria home or not. She's like, I don't need your help. Um, but Michelle is like, well, no, I insist. And um, if you, you're you supposed to not walk her home. Pauline tries to kick, to kick us out, right? Yeah, she kick, this, we, we talk about this after she kicked us out. Yeah, because it's like it's better to be safe and that's a bad ending. Uh, and it's if you're certain very well, which is how you continue. I like the the bad ending gives us some some interesting uh, information though. Uh, Foreshadowing. Yeah, and uh, Maria asks us, uh, "Did Morgana enjoy her time at the brothel? Did she say?" And Michelle's like, "I assure you, she did. That was one of the few times she was happy." And Maria was like, "I'm so glad." And she says, "All oh, you know." Th- she says some things that she, there's some things that are the same between the two routes. Um, when she says goodbye to us, she uh, she gives us a knife. <laughs> she's like, nice. here's a knife, and she's like, I love knives. Um, she's <laughs> like, oh man, anything anything with a pointy end really gets me going. And um, Michelle doesn't want to take the knife because he remembers that knives are upsetting to Giselle, and Giselle says, no, it's okay. Um, so I like how Michelle like is very like, that's the rule. No knives. It's very cute. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so we have a knife. We have a knife now. Um, this is why I didn't think it was the bad choice for a, for a minute, because like a lot happens. And um, mm-hmm. we so we walk back, and as we're walking back, we overhear uh, Pauline confronting Yukimasa. So Michelle stops and overhears their conversation and Yukimasa is like no they're lying um you know that please believe you please you have to believe me don't you trust me and Pauline says I do trust you but I would also like to see the tower and Yukimasa is like I'll show you the tower but I need to get the lord's permission first so, so I'll so I'll ask so I'll find you know I'll let you see tomorrow and uh he also asks specifically like exactly who told you this and so you know she gives him enough information to kill everyone else and then he's like well i'll, I'll tell you i'll get, bring you tomorrow which is enough time for him to kill everyone else yeah. and move her so um then once pauline leaves yukimasa is like i know you're there and um yukimasa attacks michelle with his katana but i i, I assume and uh but michelle parries with a knife he parries the knife. <laughs> Dark Souls. Yeah. What kind of sword was that? I don't know. Maybe it wasn't a katana. Maybe it was a short. I don't know. What can you? What can you? Can you parry a short sword with a knife? Why? Why can't you? Right? Because technically, you? you're just knocking it away. Yeah. I mean, realistically, no. <laughs> right? Because like, but in theory, if you were really good, I guess you could like deflect a blow with it and then you know counterattack or whatever. Goku could do it. Of a riposte, like if you like pushed it aside more than actually like a, like a full parry where you knock back, but yeah, right. no, you, you, you ain't doing much. Yeah. Nah, I mean it's. It doesn't matter anyway because Michelle then uh, he he gets like, one cool move in and then he starts to run, but Yukimasa throws his sword and impales him and uh, and we die. So that's what happens. So the right choice is to not walk her home. It's like what? <laughs> yeah, which I, I, that one got, that's the only one that really got me, that I didn't immediately figure out what the right answer must be. And, um, so Maria, uh, promises to talk to us about, more about Morgana tomorrow. And, um, Giselle, like, starts, like, fading out. She, like, kind of, like, is having trouble seeing and hearing, but she's like, no, no, it's fine, it's fine. Um, and, uh, Michelle and Giselle go back to their room to regroup, and um, Michelle reflects on how nice it is to have normal social interaction, even though he had to endure being the only man in girl talk. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, also, at this point, I also have to say, 
how did Maria care for Morgana in her first life and then completely betray her in her second life? That's that's not good. I mean, it, so Mor if Morgana's the white-haired girl, then Maria really fucked her over. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So... Maria seems to be, like, a completely different character here and in... Yeah. In Doesn't it? Yeah, this is just a... This is the one that came from left field for me. Like, I didn't see it come in or, or understand how it was going to feature. Maybe, if, you know, a bunch of times this game has explained itself. It's just taken a really long route to get around on a character arc. So I'm going to give it some time before I form anything definitive. But it just seemed weird to me in this, this particular chapter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess in her second life, she's like completely consumed with her need to kill Jacopo. I don't, I don't know. Then Giselle says a nice thing to Michelle. She says if she had found out about his body when they were still alive, she still would have accepted him. Um, oh, uh, earlier Maria makes some remark of like, I don't think this guy's really going to kill, try to hurt me. I don't think he's got the balls to do it. And Michelle gets really offended. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that was, it was sweet that she said it to him explicitly like that. And um, that Giselle said that uh, like... You know, I, I would I was still would have accepted you, like, in case that wasn't clear <laughs> from the previous chapter. And um, Michelle opens the window, and it's snowing outside. Spring, spring snow. And uh, what I thought harvest festivals happened in the fall, but yeah, I I don't know. I I don't know. It's the past. Harvesting what? Who knows? Yeah, I guess it depends on the crop, but... Judging by extensive experience with uh, Stardew Valley, there yeah. may be also <laughs> a, a festival in the spring and the fall, but that just may be because they have four months. And if you have four hearts with your closest loved one looking at you, Giselle... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michelle would, would bring, like a, like, a jalapeno to put in the soup or something like that. <laughs> Like, he wouldn't poison everyone, right? Morgana would poison everyone, but Michelle would, like, annoy everyone, for sure. Michelle would just be like, I thought you wanted it interesting, so I got the most interesting of all peppers. <laughs> yeah, the ghost <laughs> pepper. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Michelle looks at the snow, and he has, I, I guess he's never seen a, a spring snow before. Um, so he's kind of enchanted by it, and, and Giselle's like, oh, I've, like, seen a couple of them, and, and He's like, oh, it would have been nice if it was both of our first time. And she's like, that's so childish. You're cute. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and Michelle's like, well, it's you know, it's time to go to sleep. And and Giselle makes a worried face before it fades to black, which makes me think that she's not gonna be there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We get the title card one day until her death. Yep. And uh, that's as far as we read. Yep. 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 So, um, <laughs> presumably, Yukimasa is next on the list. I was, I was assuming that they were going to do this a little more video gamey, and we would get the key, like, or Yukimasa, or at least get Yukimasa's stuff out of the way, so to speak, um, on this day. But I guess they're going to do Yukimasa and the Lord on the day, on the next two, on the next day. Or I guess there's technically two days remaining because yeah. zero days will be like that day. Whatever. Yeah, there's still the day of the festival. Mm hmm So, Mel, do you forgive him or not? Nah, I guess. I don't know. He's he's just weird. Like, it's <sighs> I'd say not, not yet. He's got stuff he's got work to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't in the right. He, does he deserve to be have his soul trapped for centuries by Morgana? I don't think that fits the crime. I mean, the problem is he's he's way less culpable than the other two. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. He's he's both a victim and a perpetrator, but only he's he's more a victim than than not. He doesn't deserve to be tortured for all eternity. Definitely not. No. I mean, and I get that Morgana doesn't understand either. You know. Um. And it's sort of like, yeah. Um, well, I think that's the, it gets to an interesting point for me, which is like, what, what are we going to do when we talk to Yukimasa? And I, I feel like the only real entryway is that, because Yukimasa, I think, makes this sort of comment about like nature, like, oh yeah, it's in your nature to be like that or whatever, you know? So it's almost like 
he like the end for Yukimasa is he feels like he's got this is him like he's this is how he is and this is the way people are predetermined to be you know yeah and it's like following along with what Michelle said to Mel it's like and Nelly is that even if it's uncomfortable to talk about like these feelings you have or even things you've done that are monstrous then we have to get that out in the open and you know obviously like the mo- oh you'd hope the modern solution to it is so there's some sort of chemical and I, I don't again I'm not a psychologist or anything but like this sort of psychopathy there has to be like some sort of chemical side sort of thing going on where you need a lot of therapy a lot of medication I don't know what the 11th century equivalent of that is going to be but I don't know you you must deal I I don't know how these things are handled in in modern times like I don't I don't even know if Yuki Masa's uh viewpoint is in any way accurate as well like to to how any real person feels like you know is that is that how Logan Paul views things I don't know I mean it it's portrayed as a mental illness like the, the psychopath yeah you know, and there are people like that in real life yeah. Yeah. Is it is it an accurate portrayal though? I don't know enough about it yeah. to know if it's yeah. I mean, the only thing I've ever really heard about with like serial killers and stuff, it, or even like, or even like, you don't even have to go there. Really, it's just that like there is something that they get like the pleasure center of their brain going off by doing that. Like the sort of instincts that like people have for like you know fulfilling hunger or like normal sexual thing you know what i mean like the things that like drive you to say you've done a good job endorphin rush here you go or dopamine you know but for them it's like some perverse thing like horrible thing and it's kind of like with addictions and other things where you say like with therapy well i don't know what those extreme things i think the point fata morgana is making is like we need to talk about stuff like that even if it's horribly taboo you know yeah yeah like you need to seek help yeah. Yeah. Like, Yuki Masa's point of view is probably like, well, this is just the way I am. I can't help it. And maybe even, you know, other people are like this too and they won't admit it. That kind of thing, you know? Like, who knows how he's justifying it in his head, but he's justifying it. And it's like, it's going to take something like, listen, we got to talk about this. Uh, you know, this is not right. And you can, I don't know, be helped. You can be with Pauline and be happy, but you have to come clean about the things you've done and the way you feel. And we'll go from there. Um, I don't know where we'll go from there, <laughs> yeah. but it'll be somewhere better than now, maybe? You know, like, <laughs> maybe? Yeah. I don't even know if there's any modern solution to that problem. Like, if you're talking about someone who's just, you know, criminally... You A know, real-life serial killer. Yeah, like, this is, I think our solution in modern day is just to put them away. And even the most humane treatment, I think, in, in, in any country is to just lock them up so they can't hurt anyone else or themselves. So. There's a, yeah, there's like a really sad kind of story. I forget I forget what, what horrible reality show I was watching about people in jail. <laughs> this guy who, who, but he killed his father. He was having like paranoid delusions and uh, his father like tried to get a gun away from him and he shot him in the head. And he didn't really mean to, but like he did. And then, uh, you know, I won't go into like, sort of horrific parts of it but like I, he really regretted what he did but he was like kind of happy to be locked up in a way that he couldn't hurt people mm. which again I'm not suggesting yeah lock up people who are you know whatever but I'm saying like it, once it's out in the open like there maybe are solutions you can talk about but again like Fata Magrana has this point of like you don't get anywhere by just making assumptions or just like leaving it alone and that does seem to be like Yukimasa when he is under control he, that's kind of how he talks about it, right? Where, like, he needs somebody else to be his impulse control. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a possibility, too, right? Yeah, like... I mean, again, and I don't I don't presume, to be fair, as much as I like this game, and I do like... I really like this chapter a lot, I gotta say. I don't think they're gonna have, like, you know, the quote-unquote right answer for how do you handle somebody like Yukimasa, but, you know... Yeah. I'm really, I'm continually impressed by how incredibly thorough this game is. Like, how much mm-hmm. of a fucking deep dive this is into, like, I just, like, it's very validating, um, to also, because, like, I-, I feel like when you go through a lot of heavy stuff in, in real life, um, or some, some horrible things happen, and uh, often if you try to talk about it with, like, especially, like, family drama for example and you want to like sit down and talk to everybody everybody's like no we can't talk about this that we can't go to therapy about this 
And, yeah. um, and this game is so, like, full force, like, and they're not just, like, saying, like, you should talk about things, you need to communicate even when it's hard. Um, it's showing it in painful, excruciating detail. Like, no, this is really how it is. Um, mm-hmm. and I just, I just very much appreciate that level of commitment. Yeah, I really loved this chapter. Um, uh, uh, what stuck out for me was, like, when, uh, Nellie was trying to run away after, um, finding out Mel was, you know, culpable, uh, and just, you know, the, the emphasis on that you have to confront these things to get past them. Yeah. I'm really interested to see what they're going to do with the, with the Jacob, with the Jacob character, because... Yeah. You know, Mel, Mel was, like, easy. Mel didn't really want to do any of this, <laughs> and, um, Yukimasa... Definitely has a mental disorder of some kind that, you know, is explainable. But yeah. then the only hint we get about the Lord is that he's apparently really good for, to the economy of the area. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about that a little and bit. And people are trying to kill him all the time. Yeah, but yeah. but the merchants really like him because he apparently, like, got the city. He's, uh, he's made it great again. You would say something like that. Oh. Yes, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. It sounds like he actually knows what he's talking about. <laughs> um, but they're, they're going to have to try to at least partly redeem him, because this is the way this chapter is going. I assume. And I'm yeah. curious about how they're going to do that because he's the, the he's the least likable of them all. <laughs> you can mass is pretty close. He, Jacobo too was overwhelmed by his obligation to his family to, like, be a certain sort of ideal. So that's mm-hmm. got to be in play in this chapter, right? Like, their motivations are similar. I would think. Yeah, and if we're talking about, like, you know, this, this feudal economy, there is a role that the Lord plays in it. Like, there is a responsibility on the leader that, like, that, that has to make this society function. If not the family, then certainly the society is reliant on, on the, this, you know, this controlling figure. I don't, know, I don't know if we'll see any payoff for that, but it, it certain, there's, there's going to be responsibilities involved. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. We, we haven't even gotten to Morgana being the white-haired girl. So, like, damn, we got a lot left to read. Yeah. Yep. Are we going to read till the end next time? I mean, I'm ass- if it's the end, but I'm assuming we're... This is the last chapter. There's a little... There's an epilogue after that. I'm not, I don't know how long it is. Hmm. We'll see, I guess. Well, maybe that'll be a good way to, to, to do our final thoughts in an episode. Yeah. And have a lot of time yeah. to talk about it. Because, man, this is a lot of game. Yeah. There's a lot going on in this game. <laughs> it's funny because it's the least episodes, you know, to cover. But it feels like it's a... That's because each episode is three hours long. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Fair. Yeah. Uh, this is a great game, though. I don't know why anyone would be listening to this, you know, and hasn't decided whether they're going to buy it or not at this point. Um, you know, you should buy this game. It's extremely good. I feel like a, I feel like I'm I'm better. Uh, like I feel like my life has been improved, and my like out my perspective has been improved by by reading this game. I I feel like it's given me more hope. In a, yeah. in a weird way yeah. it's i know that sounds really stupid kind of but it it's like you know maybe problems in the maybe these sorts of things are not insurmount, insurmountable i mean and then the world happens and i'm like no nah, that's crazy but at least in that brief period when i after i read fata morgana no i really do think it's got a good lesson to impact and it does it in a way that is not preachy but is genuinely engaging and entertaining it's really good yeah, you know. it really thinks about relationships and about people interacting with each other and about how intentions are one thing and 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 outcomes are another, but th- that you can still work through things that turn out bad. Mm-hmm. And everybody in this game makes such horrible mistakes, mm-hmm. and like they 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 do something about it. It's just yeah. really amazing. I I just love that like sort of the overarching theme of this game is to just like. No, no problem is beyond just talking it out. Yeah, with a bunch of people who just never talk to each other in the beginning <laughs> at all. Yeah, which is a wild thing for like to be like a main theme of a game. And if you told me that, I would not be interested in, in any game uh, from the bat of that. But no, I've re- I've really enjoyed uh, reading through this. Absolutely. All right. So next time, good shit. We'll 
make it through the final chapter. Hooray. Until then, Fatima Morgana. Adam Morgana. Adam Morgana. <laughs> Adam Morgana. <laughs>